Are you living paycheck to paycheck or struggling to make ends meet? It can be really stressful when unexpected expenses come up. I've been there before, when I had an unexpected expense for a family emergency and I didn't have the money to pay for it immediately, having money wrapped up elsewhere. It can be really tough. But that's where Dave comes in, the banking app that can help you get up to $500 instantly with extra cash. With Dave, there's no interest, no late fees, no credit check. And that means more money to fill your tank, finally get your car repaired, or catch up on bills without having to wait for your next paycheck. You can finally tackle those expenses that have been stressing you out. Millions of people have already downloaded the Dave app to get the financial relief they need with extra cash. So, if you're in a pinch and need some extra help, download Dave and think of it as a helping hand from future you. Go to dave.com slash let's read to sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. That's dave.com slash let's read and you can sign up for an extra cash account and get up to $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfer fees apply. Banking services provided by Evolve, member FDIC. A long time ago, after a relationship far, far away, I ended up having to move into what's lovingly known here as a bed sit. Imagine a studio apartment, but much, much nastier. All the fittings are from the 80s, and they're usually in some old Victorian or Georgian, meaning the plumbing is god-awful, and you get mice in the winter. I had no choice but to move into one of these. It was that or move back in with my parents, and I happened to move into an area that was full of them. It was actually a very nice area, with these big old mansion style houses. Only thing was, they'd all been chopped up into tiny bedsits, so instead of it being some affluent upper middle class haven, it was more like an open air lunatic asylum really. No offense to anyone who lives in a bedsit, plenty of good people have been saved from homelessness over the years thanks to cheap and cheerful accommodation I'm sure. But they do, then they'll know as well as I do that they're often utilized by a certain kind of people. For example, starving artists and musicians or students who like to drink and play loud music late into the night. For every charming foreign master student, there's some absolute mental case who's barely fit to live among their fellow humans. I shouldn't really get on my high horse about anything. I think I turned out to be something of a nightmare neighbor myself, but this is purely to set the scene, nothing more. Anyway, I'm living on the second floor of some dusty, crumbling old three-story, as it was probably the lowest point in my life at that point. Because I'd been foolish enough to let my ex sign all the tenancy paperwork in my absence, it was technically her place. Legally speaking, I knew I wouldn't have a leg to stand on, and living with her after the breakup was agony, so instead of sticking it out in a place I wasn't wanted, I decided to get out while we were still on relatively good terms. Only thing was... This was right in the middle of the big pandemic, you know, so I literally couldn't have picked a worse time to try and move anywhere else. Some estate agents were closed indefinitely, others wouldn't meet face to face, and the market was just stagnant because who the bloody hell decides to move flats during a pandemic? I basically went for the first thing I found, which was the cheap but nasty bedsit I found myself living in at the time of the story. Like I said, lowest point in my life, but it honestly wasn't that bad to begin with. Apart from the smell of God knows what wafting down the stairwell from the flat upstairs, the neighbors were actually an alright bunch. Everyone kept to themselves, and everyone kept the noise down. But then, some new neighbors moved into the apartment around the back of the house, and this place is only maybe 50 meters away from my bedroom window. I remember catching a glimpse of them as they were moving in, and they seemed no weirder than the usual crowd, but then once they got all their stuff moved in, they started being loud. Like, really loud. I don't know what these people did for work, but they slept all day and blasted music all night. I mean blasted it too, not just playing a few tunes with their window open on a sunny day. You'd have thought that they were facing their speakers out the window with how loud it was. It was a complete piss take. It went on for weeks too, and I couldn't for the life of me work out why no one in their house that they were sharing stopped them from doing it. I honestly thought that it was going a bit mental at first, because how the hell was no one else hearing the racket that they kept playing until 3 or 4 in the morning? 
By the third or fourth night, I just couldn't carry on having my sleep disturbed. I'd been foreload, so it wasn't like I had anywhere to be, but the constant noise was driving me up the wall. I didn't want to be accused of breaking lockdown, so I had to think of a way of getting their attention in order to ask them, politely, mind you, to keep the friggin' noise down. And that opportunity came one day when I was doing the dishes. The sink was right near the window that looked down at the street behind my building, so when someone from the noisy house walked out their front door and down the driveway, I was able to catch them. I swear on my nan's grave that I called down to them in a politest way as I could. I said, excuse me, and then called out the same thing just a little bit louder, not aggressive in the least bit. They looked up and once I had their proper attention I asked the girl in the nicest way possible to please think of others before they play loud music with the windows open all night. I swear to Christ, what happened next will never fail to make me angry, no matter how many times I remember it. The girl looked up at me, smiled in this really sweet way, and told me to F off. I was in a complete state of shock for a second or two. Not that I've got a particularly sensitive disposition, I just couldn't believe anyone could be so rude right off the bat like that. Once the shock wore off, I was fuming, so I marched downstairs, surgical mask on, and went over to give whoever else lived there what for. They were just as non-responsive as their pal. I've lived alongside some obnoxious wankers before, but these two took the absolute crown. There was another night of loud music, only this time, they really did prop their speakers up next to an open window and did all they could to scream and shout in the hopes of annoying me. The only saving grace was that they didn't know exactly where I lived, only that I was close enough to hear their music and their efforts got them a strongly worded note on their front door in the morning. Not even from me either, so it showed someone else was finally losing patience with them. Now I won't bore you with the events of the weeks that followed, let's just say that it was a steady escalation with police being called once or twice. It turned into a bit of this house versus everyone else type of situation, and while that definitely wasn't an ideal way to live, there was definitely this attitude of whatever gets you through the pandemic. The guy who lived above me told me that he'd invested in some really bougie earplugs, and I was glad they worked for him, but in my case, they'd gotten under my skin. I mean, really gotten under my skin. Granted, they weren't the only thing that had me stressed out. It was a stressful time to be alive, but they became the sole focus of my ire. I started drinking a lot, I started smoking again, the nightly shenanigans had my sleeping pattern in the mess too, so I was up alone at night, fixating on how inconsiderate they were being. Then one night, it all just got the better of me and I went over to sort them out. I say sort them out like that because at the time, that's the thought that was going through my head. I was blind drunk, but not blackout drunk. I knew what I was doing, and I was overflowing with spite. It must have been before 4am because it was still mostly dark out, but when I walked up our street, then back down theirs, there was no sign of consciousness coming from the noisy house. There was obviously someone in there as the windows were open and music was still playing, and I refused to believe that they were all asleep at that time. So I crept up to an open window, cigarette in one hand, beer in the other, and started calling out for someone to come to the window. I called out once, then twice, then three times, but no one appeared. And after a while, it became obvious that they were just completely ignoring and hiding from me, or they were all actually passed out, exhausted. Like I said, I refused to believe it was the latter. They'd only shut the music off at 5 to 6 a.m. in the past, so there was no way that they'd gone to bed with all their music still on, even if it wasn't blasting out the windows. I lost the plot. I didn't start screaming or shouting. I didn't start to smash windows or throw anything through the opening. I just took one long last drag of my ciggy and flicked it through the open window, still lit. After that, I just walked off. I knew what I'd done. I knew it had either caused a serious carpet burn or maybe even set something on fire, but I knew that they were still awake so I figured that they put the fire out, call 999, hell they might even have to live somewhere else for the foreseeable future. All that suited me just fine, after all they deserved it. They'd done all they could to make our lives hell, why not deliver a little of the inferno right in their TV room? I honestly thought that by the time I got back to my flat that I'd be hearing smoke alarms, some panicked cries, maybe even the whoosh of a fire extinguisher. But there was nothing. 
just the gentle glow of a fire starting, one which got brighter and brighter and brighter. I smoked another cigarette, cracked open another beer, just waiting for the show to really start. It started all right. It just started in a way I never, ever intended. Before I even knew what was happening, the entire ground floor was on fire, or at least it looked that way from where we were standing. The fire engines turned up, hosing the place down in a frenzy, then the ambulance turned up and started stretchering some very poorly looking people into the back. Mostly, they looked like they had nasty cases of smoke inhalation, but another looked quite badly burned and was making these horrible groaning sounds as the paramedics carried her out. I should have felt terrible. I know I should have. But I didn't. I came face to face with my worst possible self in that moment, and it's as shameful as it is terrifying to me. I only felt a few twinges of guilt as I drifted off to sleep, and when I woke up again hung over to all hell, I instantly remembered what the bad thing was. I'd lived with this whole thing for a while now, almost three years, and there's more than the obvious reason that I chose not to talk about it. I don't talk about it not so much because it'd mean a spell in prison, but because I'm not actually all that sorry. The whole neighborhood was eerily silent in the weeks that followed that house fire. Everyone managed to get a good night's sleep thanks to me. People like that need to learn, and if it takes a few sleepless nights on my end so that other people can live in peace, then so be it. In the 20 plus years since the events of this story, I've only ever spoken about it once before today. That was with a therapist, and the conclusion of our long and very expensive sessions was that I needed to either find a way to forgive myself or learn to live with the guilt of what I'd done. There was no cathartic moment, no miracle mantra or medication. I am alone with my own ghost. But now, I'll only be alone with this for the time that it takes to send this email. I don't know if you'll be able to use this for one of your videos, and I'm not even sure if it's the kind of story your viewers will want to hear. But if anyone can sit through this and say that they're not sickened or creeped out, then they need more therapy than I do. I've never been academically gifted, and I worked my butt off to get into my first choice of college. The day I arrived, we all had to go through the first phases of freshman orientation, which included being assigned our dorm rooms. Most students had already pre-selected which style of accommodation they wanted, which was divided into three tiers. One, there were the top-tier dorms, which came with internet access and big bathrooms, but cost a few thousand extra per year. Two, and then there were regular dorms, which had bathrooms and showers but no internet. And three, and then there was my dorm, the ones they offered to save students a little money. In terms of reputation, I'd heard of confusing mix of they're not that bad to they're worse than you think, and everything in between. But when it came down to it, I knew that it made sense to put up with no internet, communal showers, and crappy cafeteria food to come out with less debt than everyone else. I was there to learn. It wasn't some spa or resort. Suffer now, reap the reward later. And that was my mentality. The older, cheaper dorms weren't purpose-built at all. In fact, not only did it become obvious that it used to be some kind of hospital, the huge heavy doors and barred windows kind of gave rise to rumors that our dorm had once been an insane asylum. And as you might expect of such a place, long stretches of corridor weren't totally uniform, but on the wings of the building, the layout totally changed, and this is where I'd been assigned a room. There were three dorm rooms, kind of cut off from the more uniform stretches by a frosted glass door. One was identical to the more uniform rooms, but the remaining two were either excessively small and excessively large. I've seen closets bigger than the smaller rooms, and I'm not even exaggerating there, while the larger room had huge windows, much more space, and even its own small master bathroom. It was only a toilet and a washing area or a sink, but in a living space where most facilities were communal, this was a heck of a luxury. I'd been assigned the more standardized room, so I started moving my stuff into it, and then as time went on, I noticed the larger and small rooms remained unclaimed. 
That evening, all of the dorm's new occupants went down to the cafeteria for dinner, and I used this opportunity to ask one of the RAs about the possibility of moving into the larger dorm room should it remain unoccupied. They took down my information and told me that they'd give me a call once they checked the register. The next morning, the RA told me the room hadn't been assigned to anyone and that I was welcome to move my stuff in at my leisure. I thought jackpot. I'd bagged a larger room for the same price, and freshman year was looking a little bit better already and all I had to do was go claim the key from the relevant RA. To kind of lay claim to it, I tossed some of my stuff into the larger room, then went down to the RA to claim the key. But when I got there, I found that they no longer had it. There was a moment of confusion on my part. It seemed impossible that what was there less than half an hour ago had gone and vanished. I walked back up to my room, trying to get the first RA on the phone to see if there had been any kind of mistake, but when I arrived... I found all of my stuff had been tossed out into the hallway, and in the largest one of the two free rooms was some total stranger. Somehow this guy had heard that there was a bigger room up for grabs and gotten the key before I had. I realized that while I'd been patiently and politely asking around for the key, this complete jerk-off had been throwing my things out into the hallway in preparation to move his own stuff in. I was furious. Beyond furious, really. I wanted to punch him in his freaking mouth. But he was bigger than me, and I didn't. I tried telling him it was my room, but he just gave me some Disney Channel chuckle and told me that I was mistaken. He'd arrived a day late, hadn't been assigned anything, and had simply moved into the room that the RA had told him to. I knew this was a huge pile of steaming nonsense, but he gamed the system, just like I tried to do, and he'd just gotten there first. Maybe if I was bigger or less conflict-averse, I'd have at least tried to intimidate him, but I'm not that kind of person. I'd never been that person, so I simply allowed myself to just stay in my assigned room. I was angry, but not nearly as angry as I was when the water pipe burst. I had to move again, only this time it was into the box room. A few days quickly became a few weeks and I was eventually told that I wouldn't be able to move back into my original room until after the holidays. Unless I did something, I'd be stuck in this freaking closet for two more months. But then, what could I do? It was a question that I kind of pondered over for quite a while. It was abstract at first, but more practical as time went by. Harassment wouldn't work, at least not directly. If he got wise to me, I'd be do a serious butt-kicking, in which case... I'd have to be much more creative. Like I said, it was all about plausible deniability, because worst case scenario, I'd be kicked out of school for harassing another student. To me, that was an even worse prospect than a beating, so I'd have to be patient and I'd have to be smart. We'll name the guy who stole my room Chad, just to make people not feel so bad. You see, Chad is named Chad here because he was one. He was popular among the girls in our dormitory, and it didn't take him long to find himself a girlfriend. I don't think it was a particularly serious relationship, more what my niece might call a situationship. And just before the holidays, the popular kids in my dorm decided to throw a little open-door party. I could hear the whole thing through my door and the divider outside. It was that loud of a party. And although the dorm was a strictly alcohol-free zone, I know the RAs turned a blind eye to their drinking. Putting up with the outside noise was a huge gripe of mine, and boy was Chad noisy. Every time he entered or exited his room, I could hear exactly what he was doing or saying, every freaking time, and it annoyed me quite a bit. The night of the open door party was particularly bad, and I honestly considered putting off my study session until the following morning, but then as the night wore on, I heard something which made my ears prick up. It was Chad and he was outside in our small, partitioned section of corridor, and he was crying. It wasn't a full-on bawling, but you could tell from the way his voice wavered. He was drunk and talking to himself, and something bad had happened, and I wanted to know what. I didn't approach him directly, not at first. I just put my ear to the door and listened. He was struggling with his keys, that much was clear. He could hear the heavy jangle of metal on metal as he tried and failed to unlock his door. 
I jumped at the sound of him kicking or punching it, and at first I was honestly about to tell him to keep the noise down because I was already livid with him. But then, a thought occurred to me. Here was the guy that I'd come to loathe, and he was vulnerable. I unlocked my door, opened it enough to kind of stick my head out, and that's when I saw Chad. He was teary-eyed, swaying, but when he detected my presence, he quickly tried to mask his vulnerability with aggression. He responds with, What are you looking at, dude? You got some problem with me? I told him that there was no problem. I just wanted to see if he was okay. He clearly wasn't, but lied and told me he was fine, just having some trouble unlocking his door. When I asked if there was anything I could do for him, he told me no at first. But just as I was about to retreat back into my room, he asked me, You got any beer? I didn't have any beer. Alcohol wasn't my thing at the time, but that's when Chad let me in on something not so secret. He told me he and Stacy had just broken up after a drunken disagreement, and that he could really do with a few more beers to drown his sorrows. That's when I tell him that, although I didn't have any booze, I did have something else. I asked Chad if he wanted to take a hit from a little ganja pipe that I kept hidden away in my room. At first, he seemed impressed that a little dweeb like me was even able to get my hands on that kind of stuff, but little did he know, that was my whole thing. Not to sound like a douche or anything, but I was into microdosing before all this new contemporary interest in it. I used to use THC to dampen my anxiety, psilocybin just for kicks, but for longer, more intensive study sessions, I used tiny, tiny amounts of lysergic acid. I wasn't that 420 stoner kid that seemed to infest college campuses around that time. I didn't advertise my recreational use whatsoever, and I suppose that's what had Chad so surprised when I suggested that we light up. He accepted and seemed really grateful that I offered. We'd definitely gotten off on the wrong foot, and any other person might have used that opportunity to begin a wholesome kind of mismatch friendship. But not me. I saw an opportunity for something else. I told Chad that I'd pay him a visit once I rolled up a joint and promised him that it wouldn't be too strong. It'd be just enough to chill him out and put him to sleep, only that's not exactly how I built it. I did put a little flower in there, but before I sealed it up, I laced the latter two-thirds of the paper with a healthy amount of lysergic acid, then placed it on the radiator to quick-dry it. Minutes later, I'm knocking on Chad's door, joint and iced tea in hand, and he welcomes me inside, totally blind to the wolf under the sheep's clothing. He seemed nervous at first. He clearly hadn't tried smoking before, but after I talked him through what he should expect, he seemed eager to blast off. It wasn't a good kind of eager, though. He had a lot of negativity about him. Usually I wouldn't trip with anyone in that kind of headspace, but if I played it right, I wasn't going to trip at all. He was. Remember what I said about lacing the latter portion of the joint with acid? Well, after I lit the joint up, I showed him exactly how to smoke it, warning him with an analogy that I thought he'd relate to, sip and not chug. He almost completely ignored me, though just like I figured he would, but by that point my plan was working exactly how I wanted it to, and God was that exhilarating. As he sank deeper and deeper into his haze, I got him talking about his breakup with Stacy, not her real name of course, but you get the idea. He was real sad about the whole thing and talked about how much he liked her, how it took him by surprise and how he'd do almost anything to get her back, so I decided to put that to the test. I waited until he was fully in that, I feel funny dude, looking around the room phase of his trip, and kept his mind occupied with thoughts of Stacy. I fed him a bunch of false guru nonsense about how women's liberation was a net positive, but that it came with certain caveats. I agree wholeheartedly that a woman does not need a man to be happy. The reverse is also true. Relationships and procreation are all well and good, but real fulfillment comes from within, not without. And Stacy was only able to let Chad go because she didn't think he needed her. And while that was entirely true, he needed to change her mind on that if he was going to win her back. He needed to show Stacy that he needed her, not emotionally, but physically too. He needed to show her that he couldn't live without her. Although he was tripping pretty hard by that point, 
Chad anticipated my train of thought almost perfectly. It freaked him out, but the idea of physically hurting yourself is distressing while sober. Fortunately, and I use that word very loosely here, I was there to keep his head straight. I kept his mind away from things like cutting or actually taking his own life and focused him on something he could handle. Chad played a lot of football in high school, not quite well enough to earn himself a scholarship or anything like that, but enough to be familiar with sports injuries. He knew they hurt, but he also knew that with the right kind of rehab, he'd be back on his feet in a matter of months. Maybe opening his third story window and scouting out a non-fatal place to land wouldn't be such a bad idea at all. Maybe it'd be worth the short-term pain to secure his long-term romance. When he showed any doubt, I told him to listen to his heart. Stacy was the right girl for him, and if he kept it Chad and just moved on, he'd lose her to someone else. Good things come to those who wait, but great things come to those willing to suffer for them. It was that last line that decided it for him, and after that, we opened up his window and started looking for a good spot to land. Chad thought that he found one pretty quick, and he climbed up onto the much nicer desk in his much larger room and then edged towards the window. Before he jumped, he made me promise that I'd go tell Stacy right away. He wanted me to call 911 or whatever too, but he made that point abundantly clear. Stacy first, and then 911. I couldn't believe he was actually about to do it, and there was a moment where I almost admired his sheer pig-headed determination. He was either extremely brave or extremely dumb, and possibly a heady mixture of the both. He scooted right up towards the open window, looked out one more time as if to gauge his jump, then after one more round of assurances that I'd run to tell Stacy, he actually took a moment to thank me. It remains the single most surreal moment of my life. I'd talked a guy into throwing himself out of a window, and he was actually grateful for it. And then, before I even had a chance to understand exactly how successful my plan had been, Chad just rolled himself out of the window, and I heard him hit the ground. I always want to say that I was able to simply saunter away with an evil grin on my mouth, but the truth is, I completely freaked out. I figured that he'd be rolling around and groaning down there, but when I peered out of the window to look, Chad was just laying there, in a very unnatural looking pose, and he was completely still and silent. I just ran back to my room, turned off the light, and jumped into bed. I didn't wipe down the door handle and my fingerprints were probably on the joint Chad was holding when he rolled out of the window, but I didn't dare go back. I just thought of a plausible explanation as to why I'd been in his room that night and why I had to leave before he threw himself out of his window. I knew I should have called for help, but I also knew that if he made a full recovery, there was a significant risk of him recalling my involvement in his destructive misadventure. That couldn't happen. I'd be kicked out of school. It wasn't malice that kept me from getting Chad help. It was just fear. Chad didn't lose his life that day, but the fact that he laid there, bleeding internally for a full six hours before someone found him, meant his injuries were life-changing. He was still a student, officially speaking, but he wouldn't be resuming his studies for at least another year, and that was the best-case scenario. I know all this because I pretended to be just as shocked and horrified as everyone else, I masked what I'd done by playing into the narrative of party, breakup, drug use, and him attempting to take his own life. I thought Chad might remember that I had talked him into it, but he didn't. He had no memory of that night, and if something has returned to him since, he certainly hasn't tried to look me up or confront me over it. I'm such a coward that I didn't even move into the larger room once Chad had vacated it. I was terrified that doing so would implicate me in some way, but... I benefited in other ways. The victim status that Chad's injuries endowed me with allowed me a much easier ride during that first year. I wasn't expected to attend classes for a while. Other students shared their notes with me and I got an automatic A on two papers that following semester. All I had to do was play the grieving friend who made the mistake of sharing a little pot with him. But as we know, that's not what happened. But getting away with it was almost too easy. I changed a guy's life for the worse, robbed an athlete of his peak fitness, over nothing but a dumb dorm room. Then I lied and I lied, soaking up everyone's pity, kind of hoping that he wouldn't make it so I'd never be implicated. I think what I did is the worst kind of evil to be honest, 
because I did something terrible, then ran off into the dark to hide. I lied. I made myself a victim of my own crime, and then just went on with my own life. But the scary thing is, is that I know that there must be more people like me. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And you just never know who it is until it's far too late. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Hey Joel, I've been a big fan of your channel for a while now and I have a personal experience I think you might be interested in, but sharing it puts me in a very difficult position. If my role in what I'm about to tell you got out, I'd be a dead man. I'm not saying that to sound dramatic, I'm saying that because I'm 100% certain that a person someone I used to call a friend, would hear about it, find me, and kill me. Now I suppose you might be asking why even risk it, if my life truly is on the line. Honestly, I'm not sure that I can answer that. I guess I just need people to know because of how unfair it all is. I tried to do the right thing. I tried to do something good for someone who actually deserved it, and instead, I destroyed two different families. I've since moved away from my hometown, the place it all happened, so I've been able to talk about it with one or two people, but for some reason it's just not enough. Now I know your comment section is very active, so if you see fit to use this story, I'd be very grateful and I'm very interested to know what your viewers have to say. I guess I wrote enough fluff already, so here goes nothing. I grew up in this really crappy little town. I know a lot of people say that, but sometimes it turns out their idea of crappy is two churches, one stoplight, and zero Starbucks. A place like that sounds positively heavenly compared to my hometown, which is more like two dive bars, one meth lab, and zero hope. Everyone with even a semblance of decency got out as soon as they could, but even so, that wasn't many. Most were anchored there through their family or fate, with life there slowly grinding them down until they're just as screwed up and bitter as everyone else. Crappy parents raise crappy kids, who were parents themselves by their late teens or early twenties. Then the cycle just started all over again. And one of those kids, not the worst, but not a good person by any stretch, happened to be a real close friend of mine growing up. We'll call him Rick, because it rhymes with prick, and that's the best word for him. He wasn't a bad person, not for most of the time I knew him anyway. He was just kind of a jerk. He was fun to hang out with, and he was pretty cool to me for the most part, but he was sorely lacking any serious moral fiber, and seemed to have zero empathy for others. We used to have a fallout sometimes and go for weeks without talking, but there were only like four people in our town who were into metal music and other such related stuff, so we'd inevitably start hanging out again after however long because we were in the same social circle. And this went on from the start of middle school until we were like 22 or 23 when he started dating this girl that we'll call Angela. I'm calling her Angela because she was the closest thing to an angel that I've ever known. I understand that might sound cringe to some, but if you knew her, you'd agree. And everything was about other people with her. She was a real people pleaser. Then combine that with the fact that she was a single mother with a baby daddy in prison, and she's a textbook example of someone whose hometown becomes just as much a cage as the one her kid's father was in. But anyway, Rick starts dating Angela, and for a while everything goes fine. He even seemed cool with the fact that she had a kid by someone else, a felon no less, and from what I could tell, he was actually enjoying the whole stepdad thing. Angela must have recognized how valuable that was, and I wasn't surprised when she asked him to move into her place, even if it was after less than six months of dating. She owned her own home, an inheritance from her grandparents who passed on, and honestly, it kind of seemed wholesome at first. We didn't see much of Rick anymore, but I guess we took it on the chin because it all seemed to be so positive. Rick stopped smoking and drinking so much, he got a job, and it wasn't a total transformation or anything. Rick was still a prick, but it was an impressive change of attitude nevertheless. About two more years pass, and our little social circle is as tight as it ever was. We're all maturing, coming into our stride, getting serious about careers and all that kind of stuff, and we could afford to do things for once, and it was a good time. 
Me and Rick started going on camping trips, something we always talked about, but always been kind of too poor to do, and we didn't really have dads or anything like that to take us. Most of the time, these trips included a beer-fueled shoving match or two, but these also included a lot of heartfelt confessions and sharing of deep thoughts, or at least what we considered to be deep. Sometimes we shared fears or certain moral dilemmas that we were in, and this one trip, Rick starts telling me about this girl that he works with. He's working nights with her, and she's really cool, and they might have done some stuff together once or twice. Not like third base or anything, just doing stuff because they were bored more than anything. It turns out the whole thing was a soft introduction to the fact that Rick was cheating on Angela, and he was cheating on her regularly. That was also the camping trip when Rick told me that he paid nothing towards the couple's bills, only occasionally contributed to things like groceries or home supplies, and actually seriously resented having to raise someone else's kid. The whole thing was just a convenience for him because he was such a saint for taking care of Angela's kid when she was at work or needed a break that he was entitled to cheat. I was appalled, but aside from telling him that he should stop, there wasn't much I could do. We were in the middle of nowhere, had all of our supplies split between packs. I couldn't just knock his teeth out like I wanted to and walk back home again. I was stuck with that guy. I ended up being kind of glad that I didn't just punch Rick in the face because throughout the remainder of our trip, I thought that I'd talk him out of cheating and have him seeing it from her perspective. We had yet another heartfelt moment where he swore that he'd change his ways, like he'd started drinking a bunch at that time too and he agreed that needed to change as well. For a while after we got back, he seemed to be sticking to his word, but then came when he asked me to drive him to a Rite Aid to buy a pack or bottle of Plan B, whatever form it comes in, and I knew that all of his promises had been bullcrap. He told me it was for Angela, but he also made me swear that I'd never mention it to her, so I just knew that he was full of it. To say that I was angry would be a huge, huge understatement. He'd been taking this wonderful person for a ride this whole time, and maybe things had been good in the beginning, but they sure weren't now. He had no intention of staying with her in the long run, that much was clear, and his cheating was already a solid sign that he had one foot out of the door. Angela was placing all this faith into a guy that was about to let her down big time, and I'm not sure anyone knew it but me. If it was any other circumstance, I'd have been able to just keep my mouth shut, but there was a kid involved, a kid who needed a stable father figure in their life, not some prick like Rick. She and her kid actually had a chance. They needed to get out of town and started life someplace else, and for some reason, I got it into my head that I could be the one to help them. It wasn't an overnight decision or anything. I wrestled with the idea for weeks, but in the end, I came up with what I believed was an airtight plan, then set to work. First off, I created a fake Facebook account, filling in the high school section with the name of the school and all that that I went to, and then I sent Angela a friend request and just waited. Just like I expected, she accepted the friend request, but was still kind of confused as to who the person was. She sent a nice message saying how sorry she was that she didn't remember this fake person that I invented. This was typical of her, assuming that it was her at fault, or at least pretending that that was the case out of sheer politeness. And that's when I hit her with a pre-written message that I'd been working on, while waiting for the friend request to be accepted. The long and short of it was this. Rick is cheating on you, and if you want a future for your kid, a real future, you need to leave town. I know money is tight, but I can set you up with a place out of town for the next couple of weeks at least. You can take as long as you need to think about it, but if you decide to do the right thing, all you gotta do is reply to this message with a date and a time, and I'll come pick you up from the house. You can't know who I am just yet, but it'll all make sense, I promise. I felt stupid in the moments after I pressed send, and I honestly didn't think that I'd ever hear back. But then, I did. Angela's reply said something like, I didn't believe you at first, but now I do. I want to leave, but I don't know how else to do it. I also need to know that you're real somehow. I don't know how you're going to do that, but just please let me know that you're genuine, somehow. I didn't know how else to prove that I was real, so I drove out to a motel in the next county over, grabbed a little brochure that they kept on the front desk. I took a picture of it, along with a few hundred bucks in cash that I'd planned on giving to her, then sent it over using the fake account. 
She sent a reply back almost instantly, telling me a date, time, and location, but when I showed up, she wasn't there. I waited for quite a while, faking some minor engine trouble as a kind of cover story, I guess, but when it became obvious that Angela had gotten cold feet, I drove home and sent one final message, just saying, offer still stands. I remember watching the chat window for a minute or two, hoping that the little gray scent would turn to scene before my eyes, but it didn't, and that's because it was already too late. And the news broke the next day. I don't know exactly what it was that drove Rick to hit her. No one does. But in my head, it happened for one of two reasons. Either Rick was such a monster that he always had it in him to hit a woman just for wanting to leave, or he started beating her out of frustration. And honestly, I think it's the second one. I think Rick found the message, my message, and he wanted to know who'd sent it. Of course, Angie didn't know, but Rick wouldn't have believed that. Quite the opposite, actually. He'd have been certain that she was lying to him as part of some grand gaslighting escape plan. I think that's what drove him to it. The fact that there was something he couldn't know. Something he couldn't control. And that's why he beat Angie so bad that she was confined to a wheelchair for the better part of a year afterwards. Doctors said that she had no right to pull through, but figured it was something to do with how much she loved her kid. Rick tried to run, but the cops caught up with him and he ended up going away for eight long years. But he wasn't the only guy to get time. Angie's dad ended up getting an even longer sentence because he showed up at Rick's parents' place one night while he was drunk. He hammered on the door until someone opened up and that person happened to be Rick's little brother. Angie's dad shot him through the mouth, said he wanted to paralyze him just like Rick had done to his daughter, said he wanted him to know what it's like to have a crippled family member. Well, Rick's little brother ended up bleeding out on the way to the hospital and Angie's dad ended up going away for life. And that was exactly 10 years ago this year, and Rick is out of prison now. I haven't met with him in person, nor do I intend to, but I've heard some of the things he said about finding out who told Angie that he was cheating on her. And that's how I know that he'd kill me if he knew this. Literally kill me. Which leads me back to my original question. How am I supposed to reconcile this with myself? All I tried to do was do a good thing for a good person, but now her life as she knew it is completely over. Her dad's in prison, and her ex-boyfriend might just come back to hound her again, wanting to know who was behind the fake Facebook account that ruined his perfect scam. It wasn't so much what I did, but the way I did it that got her hurt. So please, if this makes it into a video, which I highly doubt it will, please tell me how the hell I'm supposed to just go on living with all this in my head. I've managed ten years, ten long years, and I don't think I can do it anymore. Not without people knowing that I tried, even if it all counts for less than nothing. Hello, Let's Read. I like your channel, and I think I have a scary story of my own that you might like to include in one of your videos. I appreciate this email might go from 1 to 100 intensity-wise, so I'm sorry if this catches you off guard, but today I'd like to tell you the story of how I killed a man and got away with it. I appreciate that you might get emails like this all the time, but I can assure you my story is genuine. I used to sail a lot during my late 30s. I don't want to give away what my old job was, but it made me a lot of money and thanks to some wise investments, I was able to retire at the ripe young age of 37 years old. I'd always had a passion for sailing, so I bought a 60-foot sailboat then started sailing all over the Americas in it. Those were the best days of my life, without a shadow of a doubt, but some waters proved smoother sailing than others. Way up north, you had to worry about ice sheets and fog banks, but then the further south you went, you had to worry about some other stuff too. Sharks, tropical storms, then once you're out in the southern Caribbean, you gotta worry about the people too. If you follow the island south, you pass St. Vincent, Grenada, and Trinidad, then you hit the northern coast of South America. You can turn west and sail along the coast of Venezuela all the way to Mexico, or you can turn eastward and sail along the coast of what I like to call the old colonies. There's Guyana, French Guyana, two separate countries, and Suriname, 
which used to be English, French, and Dutch colonies respectively. Guyana is a real nice place, but the amount of poverty skyrockets as you sail into Suriname and French Guyana. As you probably know, with poverty comes crime, and when you're real poor and happen to live near one of the world's busiest shipping lanes, you can guess what kind of crime becomes too tempting to resist. Piracy. I'm not talking about the Captain Phillips style of Somali piracy. Oh no. The pirates of the modern day Southern Caribbean are a different breed. They use all the same fast boat and AK combination of their East African counterparts, and they've learned from their mistakes too. Instead of targeting commercial shipping, they target civilian super yachts and corporate fishing trips. They don't need much, just phones, cash, and anything they can sell quick and cheap. And if you cause them any trouble, they'll just kill you, shoot your boat full of holes, and hey, presto, you're just another victim of the Bermuda Triangle. Savvier sailors will avoid stretches of coast known to be watched by spotters. They sail way out to the choppier waters just to mitigate the risk, but others choose to risk the danger just for the experience, and honestly, I think it might be worth it. The people in that area of the world are some of the friendliest, warmest folks around. They'd give you the shirt off their back if you needed it, and then whip up some of the most incredible food with very little on hand. Consequently, it was an area that I really wanted to visit. Risky, off-the-beaten-path destinations are definitely in my wheelhouse, and when you know a guy who can sell you a cheap pistol for extra peace of mind, a place like that gets an awful lot less threatening. I've been plenty of places where I felt safer carrying a gun. Half of them are back in the U.S., but no matter where I went, I never had to use it. That all changed during that meander along the South American coast. I was moored up someplace, a tiny village in the middle of nowhere. I'd gone ashore to find a place to eat, then as soon as my belly was full, I hit the wall and was forced to head back to my boat to catch some sleep. A few hours later, I'm sleeping in my bunk when I'm suddenly awakened by the soft bumping sound of something touching my boat's hull. That's not the most unusual of events, but in this occasion, something told me that I better go check it out. I took the old pistol, kept my finger on the trigger guard, then started creeping up the steep stairs between the cabin to the aft deck. Once I was about halfway up, I listened out for any movement or voices, but there was nothing. So I'm halfway reassured when I climb the rest of the way, only to be greeted by the sight of a man climbing over my boat's railings with what looked like a sawed-off shotgun in his hand. I didn't think. I just acted. I shot the guy three times and watched as he fell backwards off my boat. I expected a splash, but there wasn't one. Something broke his fall. His boat. I ran over to the railing, pointed the gun at the terrified-looking man piloting the small craft, then pulled the trigger. Again, not the sound that I expected. No loud bang, just the dull click of my pistol jamming. You really do get what you pay for. The terrified pilot grabbed a hold of his buddy who was half out of the boat and who must have almost capsized the thing as he fell into it, then just revved his engine and took off. I only mentioned it hypothetically to one other person from that area of the world. They told me, hypothetically speaking, that if I was to do something like shoot an armed man who tried to climb onto my boat, that I'd done the right thing. I was told that sometimes, if the pirates rob or hurt someone who might have friends, powerful friends, who might come after them? They'll just tie the people up, torch the boat, and then disappear back into the jungle. I enjoy visiting that area of the world, but I sure as hell ain't going there again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash Let's Read Official, or send it over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. 
All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, watch out for Freddy's finger.